Welcome to the Officer Road Again podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Ross. And I'm Dan Greg. <laughs> this, this is the show. That's it. We did it. We're done. No, uh, this is our show about anything and everything off-road. We've gone to all kinds of crazy tangents uh, in the last five, six weeks, um, but we're back kind of to our bread and five butter. Five six minutes. <laughs> yeah, but they weren't along for that. I had to reference something they've known. I just realized Dan has sheep on his mug. Uh, as always, we're socially distanced. I'm in the Midwest, Ross in the Northeast, and Dan's in Australia. I am in Australia. The world's <laughs> upside down down here. Did you, Where? Did, did you get there just in time for everything to lock back down? <laughs> yeah. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> I had to be locked in a hotel room for two weeks. They have like mandatory quarantine. And then I got out of quarantine, came here to my dad's place, and now back in lockdown. Did you, okay, and this is just because I don't understand the mechanics of it. Did you have to pay for your hotel stay, or is that just government takes care of it? Oh, yeah. I paid $3,000 to be locked in a small hotel wow. room for two weeks. $3,000 Australian? Yeah, 3000 Australian, which is about 2700 US. Still, like... Yeah, I mean, that's an expensive, expensive stay. That is correct. And then add on top of that the plane flight, which was almost three grand. Which is crazy <laughs> yeah. right now. So it was definitely the most expensive trip to Australia that I've ever done. <laughs> and that's saying a lot, being that you're from there. Um, <laughs> where, where are you in Australia? Uh, I'm pretty close to Melbourne. So like down in the southeast. Okay. So a semi-populated area. We'd say go say hi to Joel, but you're all in lockdown. So no. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Literally no, can't no go. <laughs> right. Anyway. Oh, man. Okay. Industry news. Very, very, very brief industry news. There was an unfortunate occurrence over the last few days in which the BRP or Can-Am, as they call themselves today, um, their, one of their suppliers facilities caught fire. The Juarez City supply chain facility caught fire, um, effectively burned to the ground and took out like a thousand ATVs with it. So that's really the, yeah, that the, the picture tells the story. It's just, it's, it's, it's a lot of fire. Um, it was a lot of fire. It's, I mean, you don't think of them just sitting there being combustible, but obviously there are other nope. materials. Uh, plastic metal and rubber turns out is combustible but if you get it hot enough you know yeah it's unfortunate the atv supply chain is already in pretty dire condition um, if you walk into a dealer and order one tomorrow it'll probably be six months before you see it so this was a, a pretty severe blow and we're we're you know looking at adding probably another few months worth of delivery to it it's so it's, it says it took uh 200 firefighters four hours to get it under control oh, yeah that's that's a lot of dudes around running around it's a lot of fire and, so, and the smoke was so intense it created its own cloud system oh my god that's from the national weather service in el paso they were like uh we're seeing something on the radar here Mm -hmm. it's uh yep some four-wheelers so that's the only industry news it's very unfortunate and for more story hat tip to my own site atvrider.com utvdriver.com go read i should have gone there first that's my bet that's okay i just google searched and ended up on the drive <laughs> <laughs> you'll end up there eventually oh man yeah that, they've got a better image open image i don't know if better is the right i'm sorry word I'm, I'm, for I'm more, uh, you know like large large fire it, yeah it, sorry but better is not right but more of a it's just a, it looks like there was an explosion and then just like stacks of them just burned yeah. looks like everything was prepped for shipping already mm -hmm. waiting for a forklift and you know to be loaded into one of those 18 wheelers there but is what it is. These kind of things happen in the supply chain and it will, uh, they'll get over it. That, that, okay. Say knowing that they have a factory in Juarez explains why sometimes when I go camping on some of my back highways, like there are always semis with stacks and stacks of Can-Am. Mm -hmm. Like they normally have it wrapped with like a yellow, um, yeah. Like a with yellow wrapper on the outside. Like can, goes yeah. Like that and sea yeah. like are all over. Like same thing. It, they're not no, they're not in enclosed trailers normally it, 
looks like a, mm -hmm. a semi flatbed and yep. then just stacks. Anyway, random. That's yeah, one of the suppliers. So word has still yet to get out about exactly what the damage was, but we'll see. So Chris, do you have any news since uh, we recorded 24 <laughs> hours and five so, minutes ago? I, I, I <laughs> it's not going to help me to record this and talk about it on the show and then ask for help because the trip will have occurred by the time this airs. But <laughs> so we have 22 hours or 20 uh, under 23 hours in the car to drive to Montana. It's coming up very soon. I thought the truck has Wi-Fi in it because it has a cellular uh, connection. I wonder if I can hook up a Roku to the two uh, rear entertainment screens. They have like a USB or something. There, uh, there's a, an HDMI port actually. Hmm. Um, and so I got it in there and I couldn't see anything. Quick Google search. They're like changed the settings to the lowest uh, resolution. And I kind of saw the screen. It wasn't quite right, um, but I was able to like select Netflix and I hit that and then all black. And then I kind of, I hit home and then I went back to like zigzag pattern. And so I haven't done a ton more digging, which I'll probably dig into a little tomorrow, a little bit. Um, Chromecast, I guess, works better. And since uh, uh, two of the kids have cell phones anyway, I'm like, I'll just let them uh, cast it to the monitors. And to be honest, it's only going to work if they have a cell signal anyway. Once we reach the point of no cell signal, we stacked no up a yeah. bunch of DVDs. <laughs> like old ones that I haven't even wanted to watch. Which shout out to the movie Driven. I still own that on DVD. Two shows in a row. I'm referencing that movie now. Uh, terrible Sylvester Stallone F1 movie. Um, it's so bad that it's good. I I put it in the in that kind of category. Um, come on, man. He picks up quarters with hot tires. <laughs> I'll watch it this weekend. I'll get back to it. It's so bad. <laughs> Anyway, that that I threw that into the box. The kids aren't going to watch it, but uh, we're gonna, we're driving around. <laughs> okay, that's all my news. Um, well, my my news is even less thrilling. I, I messaged Jeep te Jeep chat today, and uh, the status of my Wrangler is exactly the same as it was last week. So, <laughs> Dan, to clue you, I I, I ordered a Wrangler a Rubicon, and uh, nice. a red one. The Jeep plant a red one. Yeah, a, a red. Wrangler with a stick, which is my destiny, apparently. And Sounds uh, like fun to me. Yeah, I'm at five and a half weeks since I placed the order, and it is still in the scheduling phase of production. So they still have yet to aggregate all of the parts that they need to actually build the thing. It, it did jump so, into building for like a day or two and then move yeah, back, for, right? For, for one day, it went to like D1 status. And then immediately back to scheduling, which huh. is, uh, my interpretation is code for, we thought we had everything we needed. By the way, the chips we thought we needed, we didn't actually have. Yeah. And back to uh, D. So they said eight to 10 weeks. It takes two weeks to ship to the dealer. You know, got a couple weeks and then it's, then we're over. So we'll see for now, Carlos. So, Dan, that's it. That's all we've got. So the rest yeah. of the show is you. <laughs> Just take it away. I'm gonna sit back. No, I'm joking. <laughs> yeah. Why are you in Australia? So, look <laughs> yeah, well, this is the plan to come to Australia, build an expedition vehicle, and then travel around the whole continent for 12 or 18 months. Um, I've never traveled here, even though I grew up here. I left when I was about 22. So I haven't even lived here in 15 years or so, which means really? there is a lot of this country I've never seen. I, all the crazy remote deserts and the four-wheel drivey destinations, I've never seen them. So I feel this kind of need to check out my own country and have a good look around. So that know, opens up. I didn't know they were so similar in size. Like I, I, in my mind, I think of Australia as being bigger than us. <laughs> Yeah, Australia and the US are actually really similar in size. Um, well, the, the lower 48 anyway, if you exclude right. Alaska. Alaska is huge. A beast. You know, you've been there. So yeah, I mean, there's, there's tons of exploring. The, the challenge won't be, you know, finding things to do in the year and a half. The challenge will be, I don't have enough time. I'm already <laughs> realizing, I'm like, oh, wow, I, I need to, you know, really keep moving if I'm going to see as much as I want to. 
Is there anywhere on your proposed path that you've already crossed or is it, is everything new? Uh, there are a couple of places that I've been to. Um, Fraser Island is like uh, the world's biggest sand island, actually, just off the mainland of the East Coast. Um, and I have been there before briefly, but, you know, like I've never seen Ayers Rock, the big famous rock in the middle. I've never been up to mm-hmm. Cape York with like crazy river crossings and it's kind of like tropical jungle. There are entire states I've never seen at all. I've never been to the big island of Tasmania, which is a whole state. So How do you get there? Oh, there's, a, there's like an overnight ferry. It's ferry? Like 12, a ferry. 12 hours or 14 hours or something. There's a mighty it's karma a video about that, ferry? Ross. Wow, that is a... Yeah, I... Yeah, it's Quick a big to say, trip. I don't and, follow. <laughs> yeah, and so, yeah. I mean, 90, 98% of the trip is all going to be new to me, which I'm super excited about because I've heard about these places and, and you know, I see videos pop up on YouTube from time to time of Aussies going out to the Simpson Desert or wherever they go. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, I want to go there. I'm going to check that out. There was, so, there was a series on Sundance and it was Tim Minchin. And he drove from... I don't know where he started. He probably started in Melbourne or Sydney or somewhere down in the Southeast. And then he went all the way across to Perth, but he oh, went yeah. just straight across. And I, I actually learned Australian geography by watching, cause he kept doing city names. And I was like, I wonder where that is. And I look it up and Google it. Mm-hmm. Cause it changed so much as he went. Like it was, it was actually kind of fun. It's funny to realize that even now that I'm sort of planning and researching the, the diversity, here, you know, I'll be, I'll be driving on full sand dunes in the desert, but then a week later I could be in tropical jungle <laughs> Then I could be on a white sand beach. Then I could be like in an old growth rainforest, you know, everything in between. There's snow on the mountains right now. There's massive waterfalls. It's like Australia really does have a lot of diversity. It all is just really far apart. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. <laughs> yeah. I was looking at one of the places and for the life of me, I can't remember what it's called, but it's like, it just says highway and, you know, in the States you see highway and it's like, Oh, that's a couple hundred miles point to point. And it's like 1200 miles from spot to spot. And it, it picks up, you know, nothing on the map, which is crazy. So do you have any, like, I mean, in California, you can do the craziest thing ever, which is, you know, surf in the morning and ski at night. Is there anywhere you have intentions to do anything as diverse as that? I mean, given the length of your trip, you know, a couple of days on either side is still pretty wild, but that's a good question. I, I hadn't thought about it. I mean, my brother and I have been surfing every day that I've been here um, and we could go for a drive right now and be snowboarding tomorrow if we wanted to be, oh um, except of course, lockdown, which is a problem. Mm. Um, and then there's also in the summertime, there'll be a lot of mountain biking. Uh, that's really starting to boom here. They do chairlift access and stuff. So there would be days it would be easy to go like, mountain biking up in the alpine and then go down and go surfing in the afternoon you could do that i'm sure that's pretty rad okay so what are you traveling australia in what's the uh i mean chris and i know but we'd like everybody else to know because it's coming together pretty well already yeah so i bought a 2021 jeep gladiator um and there's kind of there's a whole bunch of reasons for that but essentially you know i drove from alaska to argentina in a little two-door jeep wrangler and it was great never broke down i drove all the way around africa in a four-door jeep wrangler and it was great did everything i wanted never broke down and now it's like oh the gladiator's a bit bigger it's kind of like the same thing but more i'm like oh that that could be really interesting i'll give that a shot if anything hopefully the longer wheelbase kind of smooth things out for you a little bit yeah, I wonder. I, it, it's going to be really interesting to get it off road and and see what it's like on tighter trails, or you know how I enjoy driving it. I, I honestly don't know yet. I'm excited to find out. So, what have you added so far? So far, um, the build is very eclectic, based on the parts that are available to me, and trying not to make it any higher because then it won't fit in my dad's garage. So I'll, I'll save that for later. Um, <laughs> So, so far I've added uh, an air compressor under the hood. I added a snorkel. Um, I've added the mounting feet for a roof rack system. I've mounted a solar panel to the roof rack. And actually I'm building some rear storage in the back seat right now. And then I need to get onto wiring up my dual batteries. Um, And then I'll start building out the rear bed. I've got a 
a kitchen set up going in there and a water tank. So I'll add like a, a pump and a filter again in the bed as well. Is there a camping plan for this? Because in, in the past, you know, with your JK, you had the pop top. So what's the POA for this? Yeah, and, and I did a ton of research and a ton of planning about this. And, and there are lots of different options for like a pop-up camper in the back. You know, there's AT Overland Habitat, mm -hmm. there's the Go Fast Alu Cab, yeah, GFC. Mm -hmm. Exactly, Alu Cab. Yeah. And I think all of those, like, they're really interesting and they have their pros and cons. Chris, we're seeing your family. Sorry, Dan. Again? <laughs> <laughs> that seems related. At least they're cute, right? <laughs> this happens every once in a while. Kids get in the way of everything. Sorry. I'm sorry, Dan. Continue. <laughs> That's okay. They all have their pros and cons, but my biggest goal for this build is to keep it light. Um, the worst thing about the Jeep I drove around Africa is that it was just too heavy. It was right at its GVWR. I think it's like 5,900 pounds. And it just, it's not that enjoyable to drive off road. It really bucks around. It, you have to go really slow in the rough stuff. And so my goal is to keep this one below GVWR. Um, and so in that vein, I don't want to have one of those pop-up campers because they're kind of five or 600 pounds of just, you've just used up that much payload. Um, so actually the plan this time is to go Australian style. And Australians have been camping in what they call a swag kind of since yeah. forever, which is sort of like a canvas sleeping bag of sorts. It's, it's kind of a sleeping bag that has a built-in mattress and it's made out of this really durable canvas and you literally just roll it out on the ground and that's mm -hmm. it. You're ready to go. So it takes like 30 seconds to set up and adds like 20 pounds. Yeah, exactly right. Yep. You literally just like undo the buckle and kick it and it unrolls and that's it. Set up. Oh, okay. You're talking like, like legit swag. I, I was opening an image of a swag tent and that is not what yeah, you were describing. So, you mean so like swags, the swags these days, they got a little bit fancy and they have added kind of poles and guy war ropes and they, yeah. So now we're looking at a photo of like old school swag. But then there's these new kind of fancy, yeah, they look much more like a tent. As we <laughs> Meanwhile, in America, swag does not mean that. No. <laughs> so, yeah, the plan is, I mean, because I'm here in Australia, it's, it's pretty safe compared to some of the other places I've been in the world. And so why not give this a shot while I can? Because one day in the future, when I drive across Kazakhstan, I probably don't want to sleep on the ground like that. <laughs> and, and then I'll have some sort of who knows what. But right. for now, take advantage of what the local conditions allow me to do. I, I think of this as I, when I was uh, very early on in Boy Scouts, or just came with my family, this was referred to as the pup tent. Like this uh -huh. is so much, so much more advanced, so much better than those miserable little tents that I slept in. <laughs> it, Have you it, considered ways, building it, like... Sorry, go ahead, Ross. No, after you. Oh, I was going to say, you know, in some ways it feels like a bit of a downgrade from the pop-up roof in Africa and, you know, sort of that was quite luxurious. But at the same time, I kind of pine for my little two-door Wrangler because it was just so lightweight and so simple and there was no stress. There was, I kind of didn't have anything to maintain or think about or worry about because it was so easy. And, and so I kind of am aiming for that a little bit to go back to like life is simple, life is easy just kick out a swag on the ground and that's it camp set up like no no stress mm -hmm. have you considered dividing the bed in half so that you could sleep in half of it and then the other half is utilized with like you know all the wheel tire you know recovery gear that kind of stuff uh i actually never really thought about it because the bed in the gladiator is only five feet long um and i'm six foot two so I would have to sleep with the tailgate open and I, I, I get know, open. Okay. thinking about keeping the rain off and the bugs. And I just never really crossed my mind. And I don't know. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So what else is on tap? So, so you have solar going and is there a lift and or wheel and tire plan or is this going to like, are you just going straight minimalistic, you know, see how far you can get, how much you can do with it the way it is from the factory. Uh, wheel and tire will be upgraded. Just a very modest increase in tire size. Australia has extraordinarily strict laws about how much you can increase tire size. How so? Um, 
oh, they just, you can only increase the diameter by 50 millimeters, which is like two and a half inches. Yeah. Uh, any more than that, you'd have to go and get an engineer's certificate to say that it meets, you know, all the safety standards for emergency braking and whatever else. So basically, even to put 35s on a Wrangler or a Gladiator here, you'd have to spend four or $5,000 to get an engineer's certificate. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's difficult and annoying. And lots of police will probably pull you over and then, you'll have to show them a certificate and then it's like a big argument and annoyance. And so in a lot of ways, it's just so much easier not even to consider 35s stay smaller than that. So I'll actually run about, yeah. Yeah, they're about, they're about 34s is what I'm going with. Two, eight, five, 75s. Okay. 16 or 17? 17s. 17s. Okay. Yeah. That's, yep. yeah, no, that's, that's for 99.9% .9 of off-roading. That's enough tire. Exactly right. Yeah. And I, and I have to, I'm always considerate of overall weight. So, you know, 35s or 37s are heavy um, and gas mileage as well is, is a big consideration for me because I am yeah. going to drive 40, 50,000 miles and oh gas God. over here is like, I'm not sure in US, but probably like 550 a gallon or something. How much is it a liter? I'm going to convert it as we speak. It's, it's right now. It's about $1.50 Australian a liter which must be about $1.30 US times $1.30 times 3.8, whatever that is. That's like five fifty. You're close. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, yeah. That's almost exactly what it is. That's, that's worse than yeah, California. That's, that's, that's fucking so sexy. I don't want to drive a vehicle that only gets 12 or 14 miles a gallon. Like that's just yeah. not in the realm of possibility for me. I have to do everything I can to keep it right up. Right now I'm getting 21 miles a gallon in the Gladiator. Yeah. So I want to keep it up there. Manual. No, actually. Uh, so over here, our choices are very limited. The Gladiator only comes with a 3.6 liter engine. You okay. cannot get a diesel at all. And it only comes with the eight-speed automatic. You cannot get it in a really? shift. Hmm. Huh. And is that a ZF box? It is. Okay. No, uh, is, is it? I don't know. I think so, but I'm actually not sure. FC, well, not FCA. Stellantis uses, they have their own in-house eight speed uh, it's called torque flight and they also use the zf but i don't know which the gladiator has that's really interesting that the manual is not available though um is that gladiator like if you bought a wrangler rubicon would they have offered the the six speed there or that gets really complicated uh <laughs> because you can also get the wrangler in australia with a 2.2 liter diesel a four cylinder diesel which is like the, the export euro diesel and that I believe you can get in a six speed, but not if you get the Rubicon package, because I think the clutch isn't strong enough for the lockers, I think. Mm. And then if you get the Wrangler with the 3.6, I, again, I think you can get it with a six speed, but maybe not if you get a Rubicon. There's, there's weird kind of limitations there. And from what I can see in the Gladiator, they never would fit a clutch pedal in because you're sitting on the other side there's already basically no space for your left foot to rest because it just hits the transmission tunnel. And so I think trying to get a clutch pedal in there doesn't look like fun to me. That's very interesting. Yeah. I mean, mm. we don't, we don't have a manual available with the eight speed here. It's manual with a 3.6 or you don't get a manual, you know, right. not, yeah, you not with, two liter. With, the, with the three liter diesel, you can't get a manual. Yeah. Nope. Not with the diesel, not with the 392, not with the two liter. So if you want to stick, you have one option. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think the take rate is really low. Well, because automatics are calmer and nicer and on long journeys, and more comfortable and more fuel efficient. And, yes. you know, <laughs> yeah, I, and I've never, I've never driven an automatic really for any length of time. I've never owned one. And so it, it definitely is easy to drive. You know, it's like a big go-kart. You just point and shoot. And it's like, oh, yeah. oh, this is really relaxing and easy. <laughs> well, and in tight spots on a trail, you can left foot break. Like there's so many other, it, it gets, it can do both. You can do both. Like it both have positives. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And I'm just excited to kind of learn about what the pros and cons are and get some experience. And then, you know, in the future, use that to make decisions about future vehicles. Yeah. I, I think the, the manual preservation society is all about like the experience of driving the manual and it's more fun. I know Ross ordered his manual and Everything I, I I haven't had a manual transmission since my, I drove my '88 Honda Accord as my first car, 
And I loved it then <laughs> because I felt a part of the experience. Like I was, you could slam gears. Like I wasn't slamming gears in an 88 Accord, but like you could act like you were. Mm-hmm. And I guess yeah. I, my 04 Wrangler had a manual too. And I just forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> Poor little Wrangler. <laughs> But everything else I've had since it's an automatic. Do you think that Wrangler's still alive somewhere? Probably not. It was in Florida. <laughs> oh, it was in yeah, no, definitely. Not. The 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 way TJ frames rust, I doubt that Wrangler got out of Florida. It was near the beach too. Poor little I, I Might have been looking for TJ's on Craigslist today, and out of the three ads for TJ's in the you know TJ era. Uh, two of them might have been for frame repair. Yeah. <laughs> Not for an actual vehicle, just for frame repair. Yeah. Salvage title. So, yeah. So, Dim, what else do you have on the docket? What else is, uh, what do you have planned for the truck itself in terms of the build? And then uh, when do you set off? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. Tell I've, me got, <laughs> I've got an auxiliary fuel tank lined up. So I'll be adding an additional 20 gallon tank underneath, which is sort of mandatory here for some of the remote stuff that I want to do. Um, I'm going to attempt to drive the world's most remote road, which is about a thousand miles of nothingness. No, no anything. So uh, no fuel stops, no towns, no nothing, no people, no infrastructure of any kind, no water. Um, So then yeah, additional gas tank is a must. And then a big water tank. A big water tank as well. I think it's about, I forget, uh, 15 or 18 gallons of water tank will be mounted in the bed. Um, and then on the front, a bumper, lights, a winch, kind of the traditional four-wheel drive options. But really, the, the creature comforts, again, are my focus. So, you know, the solar panel, the, the fridge, the kitchen setup, those things are really what I'm focusing my energy on. Mm-hmm. So um, after, plan, yeah, after but, a long sorry. day of driving down the most remote road, you can actually like enjoy yourself and not, you know, feel miserable. That's it. Exactly. Yeah. Because on a trip like this, as the weeks turn into months, if you feel miserable every day, you just say to yourself, oh, well, I don't want to do this anymore. Like this is stupid. I'm going home. So yeah, no, I really, I want it to be my home and I want to be, you know, warm, dry, comfortable so that I can every month I can say, this is fantastic. I want to keep going. I want to explore more. I'm intrigued by this. Like I, because like, I can't imagine taking a long-term trip in the U S because like, I'd be like, Oh, I just swing back to the house. Like, Mm -hmm. I mean, you have relatives and friends and family like that, but like my kids annoy me too much. (laughs) (laughs) You can't get that remote in the U S you know, lower 48. Even the it's, most remote spot in the lower 48 has other dudes there also trying to reach the most remote spot. <laughs> yeah. Are you going to carry extra fuel? Is that is is there That's, supplemental full fuel in addition to the ox tank? To the ox tank, a plan? Uh, probably for a couple of the things, the Simpson Desert, the Canning Stock Route, I will probably carry an additional couple of jerry cans. I actually haven't. It, it'll probably... I'll wait and see. Once the build's finished, once I've got the auxiliary tank installed, I'll I'll get some real world numbers on what my range is and then I'll make some decisions based on that. Fair enough. Is there... So your last adventure was Africa, as everybody knows. Is there anywhere on this trip that poses to you the same kind of uncharted territory like you're breaking ground you don't really know what you're getting yourself into type scenario i don't think so ross australia has been pretty well covered by the four-wheel drive crowd um so the challenge isn't that it's uncharted but i do think it'll be more extreme four-wheel driving um Mm -hmm. cape york in the north has a lot of very deep river crossings Um, The Simpson Desert has sand dunes that will, I believe, you know, take everything the Gladiator's got even just to drive up. Um, So there'll be, there'll be a lot of places where I'm sort of pushing harder. Although, you know, thousands of other people have been there before me. It it still is extremely difficult even just to to get there, just to Mm. go there. Sand dunes change. I mean, so does if you're trying to go through, you know, the 
planned against where the surf comes in, you know, mud pits, all that stuff changes. Yep, exactly right. And so it will be, uh, and for me especially, it'll be very unknown because I've never been there. So it'll feel like, uh, you know, wild adventure to me. Although I guess there'll be plenty of people who'll be like, oh yeah, I've been there. I did that. Is, is there an element of this trip of kind of similar before in Africa, you had some, uh, for lack of a better term, co-pilot show up. Is there, Are there going to be people regionally that hop on with you for a little bit and then hop off kind of thing? Uh, like pe- like like a local expert, I guess, is what I'm thinking of. of like a, I think of Jeep clubs here in the US. Like there's a Jeep club everywhere. They could take you to their favorite trails. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I definitely plan to include my family on this one. It, it's a big part of the reason that I've come to Australia. Oh, that's so awesome. I'm <laughs> really hoping my dad will come along, like maybe for the world's most remote road, you know, like take yeah. him out for, for 25 days or whatever. Um, and my uncle lives up in the north and he's got a kitted out four wheel drive. And so I really hope he's, he's a lot more crazy <laughs> than I am. And I really hope we can get out. He's hilarious. He goes shark fishing and he's. So it'll be really great to include him in this trip. And he sounds I mean, very Australian. <laughs> yeah, shark, wait till, shark wait fishing is an unfamiliar it, term. Wait till you hear his accent. If you think that I'm Australian, you, you haven't seen <laughs> nothing yet. <laughs> is he the type? Oh, okay. of, well, is it the type of accent I won't actually be able to understand? It's like, <laughs> let's find out. I don't know. Actually, okay. I haven't seen him for a couple of years, but I'm I'm excited mm. to get out and just follow and he's crazy and he's wild so i'll just be like oh i don't know i'll just follow you (laughs) (laughs) well if you guys want to dial in give us a shout yeah i I, I just want a quick zoom meet dan's uncle (laughs) like a half hour check-in once in a while so we know you're okay Um, it should should be a lot of fun to yeah include and and friends from back when i used to live here a long long time ago hopefully i can bump into some of them um family christmas will be amazing we're hoping to be down in tasmania for that Okay. Which, there'll be old growth forests and huge waterfalls and really remote beaches. So just kind of roam around for a month and explore. Has your family joined you at all in any of your adventures? Uh, only a tiny little bit. Um, my brother was living in Canada when I started the Pan American Highway. And so we traveled together for about two weeks in Canada. And then I flew out to see mom and dad. They were in New York City at the time. Mm-hmm. And then they flew down to Buenos Aires when I was down in Argentina. Um, and that's it. No one came to Africa. It just, it didn't work out that way. We really wanted to, but it, it couldn't happen. So yeah, this is, this is as much a, a trip about Australia as it is for me about my family and my friends and, hmm. and sort of reconnecting and, and having adventures with people that I love. Yeah. It, it, it will be genuinely interesting to see that tie into the narrative of this trip, you know, because Chris and I always talk about this and, cars and trucks and off-roading and all of that is you know as amazing as the tech is and the actual wheeling is like what you can share with people is really where it brings it home so you know if you have the opportunity to tie anybody into it it, it, there's absolutely nothing better than that yeah i agree so much it's it's about the experiences that that we can go and have because of our four-wheel drives and experiences are great when you can share them with people. Thousand percent. That's literally why I have a Jeep that will possibly deliver be delivered sometime in the next decade. Um, <laughs> I like so that, that you said you have it. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's all I have. yeah, how I have a deposit. No, um, Tasmania looks amazing. Yeah, it really does. And, and again, like I've never even been there. So I, I actually don't even know, but uh, my brother's been there a couple of times and he's like, oh my God, Dan, like I can't wait to take you to Tasmania and show you around. He actually, he rode a bicycle around most of it on just gravel roads. And he's like, oh, you just see like kangaroos and stuff every day and super friendly people because there's hardly anyone there. So like it's, it's not, not uh, huge either. <laughs> uh, it's not huge, but I don't think it's tiny either. Like, I guess we'd, we'd have to Google exactly what it is in size, but it's, I mean, it's going to be a solid month or two of exploring for sure. Dude, it looks that great. Long? Oh my God. It actually, there's a mountain on Tasmania and, you know, by Australian standards, mountains aren't very big, <laughs> but, but it does get snow yeah, in what's the elevation? <laughs> and, and actually, I just heard about this the other day, less people summit that mountain every year than summit Mount Everest. Because oh, it's, just, and, it's just out in the wilderness and it's, it's like, remote. It's, yeah. A, yeah, it's like a couple of days to hike to the top of it. Like it's not even mountaineering, 
but just so few people get there every year. So it is just like this kind of wildernessy, not many people around, which to me, like, I'm all about that. That's exactly and it, where I want And it's be. far enough south for winter weather. Like, yeah, they have ski resorts. Yeah. That's yeah. the the thing. The, the other thing for us to process is like the further south you go, the colder it gets. Like for us, the south is hot all the time. Like you got to flip mm-hmm. it, guys. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's um, messing with my head a bit because I've flown here and it's, it's full winter right now. So it's right now it's oh, maybe like 45 Fahrenheit and windy and raining and like this is... <laughs> This is yeah, a it's chilly. winter. Can yeah, you send like, some ooh. of that over here, please? <laughs> yeah, dude, it's insane. It's hot. It is yeah. unfortunately hot here. Wow. And just we just both of us need to trade about 20 degrees both oh, ways, and we'll be yeah, that's perfect. Right. Meet in the middle somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. <laughs> Meanwhile, friends in Arizona are like, yeah, it's 117. It's a dry heat, Ross. It's every day, heat. but there's no humidity, so it's dry heat. Yeah. It's fun. So crazy. It's fun. still hot. So this this trip will be, at least you'll kick it off in the winter, right? So you won't be up against mm. any crazy temperatures. That's right. Yeah, I hope to be on the road in August, but you know things are slipping. <laughs> we'll see. Late September. August, early September. <laughs> um, and actually, the thing with Australia is kind of if you drew a line about across the middle, a horizontal line, you basically don't want to be anywhere north of that line during the summer. So like November, December, Jan, Feb partly because it's 45 Celsius every day, which is like right. 120, but also oh because it's the rainy season because it's so close to the equator. It just thumps with rain like eight <laughs> hours a day. And then basically all of the tracks close. So, you know, the world's most remote road and all those things I'm talking about, they're all closed at that time of year because there's just too much rain. It's just impossible. And so my basic plan is to sort of be in the South during the hot months and then be in the North during Australia's winter so in a sense the weather actually limits where i can be when so so out of melbourne north first yeah the plan would be go north for a while and then once it starts getting too hot i might come back down south again for christmas all the the hot months be down in the south tasmania (laughs) all around victoria which is the the state that melbourne's in and then as soon as it cools down again which maybe is about march or april start racing north and, and get up into the big deserts and everything so i love i love the inversion of the season yeah. <laughs> it takes a while to get your head around and even like yeah. driving on the wrong side <laughs> of the road and, and sitting on the wrong side of the car and everything i'm like oh gee, i gotta concentrate like it's it doesn't <laughs> come you, naturally anymore <laughs> when's the last curve? time yeah when's the last time you owned a vehicle with the driver's seat on the right side oh uh <laughs> when i left australia in about 2004 i'm gonna say oh man 2003 maybe yeah it was a long time ago so i've been back visiting family like drive dad's car and but it's it definitely you have to concentrate it's like <laughs> you have to, especially when you get to a big intersection and you look and you think am i going to the left of that traffic light or to the <laughs> right of it like oh, i'm not sure <laughs> My my favorite Ted Lasso callback throughout that entire series is is the Americans almost constantly getting hit by cars because they're looking the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, and actually, where I am now is pretty close to a, a big famous touristy area called the Great Ocean Road. It's super beautiful coastline road, mm-hmm. and there's signs about every ten miles that say, "In Australia, we drive on the left." And there's like a big arrow and a big sign, and because so many tourists go there, they yes. they park. You know, mm-hmm. you look at the beautiful scenery jump back in the car and start driving and they just drive on the wrong side of the road yeah they go right back to what they're comfortable just to forget yep. yeah so there's like big crashes every year because people are driving on the wrong side of the road it was the the only time i was ever in london like it's literally painted on every sidewalk as you get to a crosswalk of which direction you were supposed to look mm-hmm. and yep. the worst thing i ever did was i thought i was crossing the street as somebody was waiting to turn and so like i just naturally like jogged and hurried up and then walked slow thinking I had cleared the lane he needed already. <laughs> and in fact, I hurried across where he did need to be and walked yeah. slow through the lane he did need. Oh, <laughs> and it didn't hit me till like later that night <laughs> that I had done that. And I, I was, at least he was polite and didn't like honk or like cuss at me. He was like, that's a tourist. Like <laughs> This guy went home and was like, Americans. <laughs> exactly. yeah, right. He did that on purpose. <laughs> I think I had my Royals hat on. Like they don't play oh. baseball over there. Like they knew exactly where I was from. <laughs> Not have been wearing a Royals hat anyways. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah, they're <laughs> oh, so man. 
what what <laughs> may and you you don't have to limit it to one but like and because there were probably so many of them but like what was your takeaway from almost a thousand days in Africa that you were like these are a hundred percent of things that I have to put in this vehicle now um without a doubt the drinking water and filtration setup okay for the for the types of trips I like to do, the remoteness that I'm chasing, there is no trip if you don't have drinking water. So yeah, it, it's fundamental. Um, for me, having a fridge really increased my happiness because okay. now I can cook better food and vegetables and mm-hmm. you know be healthy. That's Stock up when you hit towns and such. Exactly, yeah. And it, and it comes back to that thing of you want to enjoy the trip instead of sort of tolerating it. And it and it's, it's doubly true because you're not just going out for even a week or two weeks or three weeks and then sort of coming home and unwinding and sitting on the couch. It's actually just continuous. The trip doesn't end in that way. So you have to concentrate on your happiness and you have to you know, have creature comforts that mean you enjoy yourself. So yeah, the fridge was a big one. And solar panels as well. I think they, they sort of bring me some sort of happiness of like... <laughs> oh, wow, I'm getting free power. Like, I love this. And like, I'm up there every second day wiping off the dust. And like, it just, it's like a novelty that I, I enjoy somehow. The little engineer inside me enjoys that. Yeah, I, I, this self-sufficiency is a beautiful thing. I watched mm-hmm. a video the other day of someone building a miniature hydroelectric dam for like, I, and I have literally no idea what the purpose was. It was just a YouTube video and I got sucked into a rabbit hole and I was like, what am I doing right now? But it was awesome because yep. it's just one little tiny capacitor and it was lighting up like LED power lines up the hill kind of thing. But I was like, that was cool. Mm. Yeah, there's something there's something uh, incredible about self-sufficiency, isn't there? Or like building a machine that then helps you and you can just like sit back and watch it and get some sort of satisfaction. Like, oh, yeah, that's oh, cool. Yes. So for, for you, like you've done the math on panels versus... And you, you said dual battery earlier, right? Yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I, I like looking at solar diagrams. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And actually, I've just been pouring over them the last couple of days. I'm, I'm going to go out this afternoon and start wiring it all up. Okay. Oh, boy. How big is your panel? <laughs> uh, I've got a 100-watt panel this time around. Okay. Nice. And is so, it? Yeah. where's it going to live? Uh, it's going to live up on the roof rack. So for the first time ever, I'm going to have a roof rack on this vehicle. Um, <laughs> primarily because, you know, I'm in Australia. I should incorporate some fun while I'm here. So I'm going to bring surfboards with me on this trip. Um, not, that, not that surfing is the focus of the trip, but, you know, from time to time, it'll be amazing. Post up in a beach town and, and go <laughs> surfing every day for a week or whatever. I uh, <clears throat> tried surfing exactly twice and both times were... <laughs> As fun as you, th- uh, there were as many face plans as you think there would be, but there it was also as fun as you would think it is. Absolutely, yeah, and it's one of those things where you just you constantly learning and growing. And and I'm not very good. I really haven't done enough of it yet. So I hope during the trip I can improve. Yeah, that's. I, I think I know my age here, where I haven't tried snowboarding or surfing. <laughs> just I, I know it's not going to go. The good thing <laughs> is. If you fall when you're snowboarding, snow is usually soft. And if you fall when surfing, the water is usually at least your, you know, as like an introductory level, it's usually pretty friendly towards you. Yep. Yep. The big difference between the two of them is that when you're snowboarding, when you fall over, you can kind of like gather yourself, think what you did, and then just stand up and try again. And so by the time you get to the bottom of the mountain, you've maybe had like 10 minutes of actual like practice time. Mm -hmm. But when you're surfing, you could be in the water for an entire hour, paddle, like not catch waves, struggle. Finally, you get to stand up and you get about a half a second of stand up time. Then you wipe out and you're like, I've been trying for an hour and I've actually had half a second of practice. Yeah. So, Uh, but you could also take ski lift the whole way up and fall, get off ski lift and never have an opportunity to make it to the bottom. True, but at least <laughs> before getting off the lift, at least you're at the top now. All you have to do is yeah. like, all, all you have to do is like Get pick up your bruised ego yeah. and like shuffle <laughs> to the side. Yep, let's yeah. stick to Where my regular it? skis, guys. Nice try. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's a, it's a great game when three of you, two of your friends and you take the ski lift to the top, and then upon getting off a lift, it's just a 
who's the best at rugby? You just punch each other. (laughs) Totally. (laughs) Oh, man. Sweet. (laughs) How? Okay. I don't don't know where else to go. (laughs) Yeah. So what else, Dan? What else can you tell us? I mean, this is... uh, Well, real fast. Uh, Geolanders, right? Yeah, good um, Yokohama Geolanders. I was going to say, like, it's, it's on your jacket there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I was phrasing that question earlier, I was like, Wild Peak, Wild Peak. I was like, no, that's not no. That's the wrong. That's Falcon. No, no, like, no, no, no. I, it, took me, <laughs> it took me a good 30 seconds of my head to rethink the question. But so no, I'm actually interested in Geolanders because I want to put some on the Suburban but I don't want, like I put Toyos on the Sequoia. They're too aggressive. It's too loud. Okay. But okay. Dan, you ran KO2s in Africa. I did. Why Yogama? Is it <laughs> sponsors? I mean, we have no yeah, shame, I, you know, if that's what it I is. I am that's working with Yokohama for sure. Um, but I'm, I'm really interested. The new one, they call them the XATs. They are basically cutting edge, you know, halfway between mud terrain and all terrain. But so they have um, a much newer design tread pattern. They were, from the minute I put them on, they were so much quieter than the KO2s. Just immediately, really? I was like, whoa, I'd noticed that first thing. Um, they're really long lasting. They have a tread warranty of, I want to say, 40,000 miles. So the, the goal is actually to go right around the continent on one set of tires. Same like, as that. It's like one lap of America. Yeah, like yeah. Should race. Need, yeah. But, so, so in a sense, I mean, like they just work, which I like. That's kind of my whole motto is like simple and it works is what I'm looking for. Hmm. what did your gladiator come with as factory yeah over here the again they're different because of regulations and stuff it actually has km3s on it right now and they're only okay. 255 70s even though it's a rubicon 20 so, 255s wow yeah, oh, about 30, that's skinny, skinny. 30, 31s yeah. maybe i had 255 75 16s on my forerunner once upon a time km2s and they're straight up pizza cutters you know so yeah no these tires they they remind me from the tread pattern of like where a dura track and a a, like a falcon you know the wild peak would cross over Mm -hmm. it's a good place to be that that photo you're looking at that's the current those are the km3s that are still on it i haven't changed the tires yet it's on the list but I'm I'm they worried. Do if, look I put, skinny. if I put the Geo Landers on now, I it's going to lift it maybe an inch or two, and then maybe it won't fit in Dad's garage. <laughs> just air so, down, just yeah, yeah. twenty psi, you'll be fine. Or the other plan is just put them on last minute, just before I leave. Like <laughs> final final thing that I do: bolt the roof rack on, put the new wheels and tires on, and then hit yeah, the road. just yeah. learn the new characteristics of the tires as you hit the road for your adventure. Yeah, He's what could time. possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have a, an inkling of what wheel you're going to go with? I do, actually. Uh, I really am still fixated on the idea of steel wheels because okay. they're indestructible. And so, actually, I bought the spare wheels for the Gladiator are okay. actually a, a steel wheel. And so, I bought five of them. And I'm just really? going to slap the tires on those. Yep, 17-inch steel wheels made by Mopar. Um, yep. And I'm a little disappointed they don't protect the valve stem. I really wanted a tire again that did that. Well, it's and just... Yeah, it just sticks out. Um, and so I actually was trying to bolt on the same wheels that I have on my Africa JK. I wanted to run those on the Gladiator, but they actually don't clear the rear brake caliper because oh. the brakes are so enormous on the Gladiator. Well, they, they technically cleared the caliper. I tried it on a friend's Gladiator. They cleared it by the thickness of a piece of paper. And so I decided that I didn't want to drive around like that. That does not instill any kind of confidence. No, you don't want anything to do with that. In my mind, that means they don't fit. So yeah, those wheels on the screen right now, that's what I'll be running. Cool. Again, simple and it works. How how much more do they weigh than the OEM wheels? Any idea? Shockingly, they're exactly the same weight. Really? Yeah, no. I couldn't believe it. Sold. <laughs> Done. Someone on the Gladiator Forum weighed the original wheel and the steel wheel, they're 27 pounds. And they're exactly the same offset. They're exactly the same everything. Perfect. Yeah. Done deal. Usually the yep. steel wheels, I, I had the FJ Steelies on my Forerunner 
and they were so fucking heavy. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, it was on like, my it was, Africa. Yeah, oh. on my JK, my wheels are really heavy, so it'll be nice yeah. here and just another way to shed a little bit of weight. Yeah, it, it was eighty-three pounds wheel and tire. What corner? Yeah, that's heavy for, for thirty-four. You know, not even like eighty-three pounds is usually like thirty-five territory. That's oh, yeah. that's so much. Yeah, and it makes a big difference. Like, even though they're not race cars, unsprung weight does make a difference to how it handles and and how it drives. And how much it wears on things like ball joints and, and wheel bearings and bushings. Absolutely, yeah. And, and on the kind of trips I do, I just don't want to have to think about those things. I just want all of those <laughs> to last minimum 100,000 miles with no energy on my part because I just need to rely on it to not wear those things out. Was the, was the Africa JK brand new? No, no. I bought it in 2015 and it was a 2011 it okay. had uh 60 000 miles on it when i bought it right because I, me- I remember mercedes turbo diesel before it yeah that whole rabbit hole of <laughs> the pain and horrendous <laughs> times in my life that i don't Sorry really to like to talk up. about much Wait, yeah. <laughs> i don't know if i know the story can what? we can we tap into this real quick sure sure let's just oh. dig the knife in and twist yeah, it just, a little bit yeah so- just just Ross, a little preference here. When I was just randomly surfing the internet, I discovered this thread of a guy who was like, I'm going to go drive around. I think it was on Reddit is where I found you. And he was just like, I'm going to, I'm going to, I want to be more reliable. Is that what? <laughs> I'm not sure if you're laughing with me or laughing at me. <laughs> oh, it's, I'm fully on board with any engine swap. I'll, I'll even help do the work. I love engine swaps. I haven't done a lot of them. I haven't paid for a lot of them. Yeah, I, I can tell. Yeah, <laughs> I'm still too happy about it. Yes, you're, right. you're actually laughing. That's right. No, I, the plan was, Ross, I bought a four-door JK Wrangler and I became fixated on the idea that I had to have diesel for Africa, mm-hmm. that it was impossible in a gas vehicle. And so a million hours of research, I settled on the OM606 straight six Mercedes turbo diesel Mm -hmm. because it can be fully mechanical, but it's also still really efficient and smooth. That's the one that's in like the Sprinter and... No, actually. The Sprinter has a five cylinder. Yeah, this is a straight six. It was only in sedans (laughs) in the US for two years in 98 and 99, Um, but it's been in lots of things in Europe. And it's, hmm. it's kind of regarded as the best all mechanical engine that you can swap into stuff, okay. except, except that it's pretty big because it's a straight six, it's pretty long. Um, and so I paid a guy to do the work for me and he did amazing fabrication work. He worked his fingers to the bone, but it just was never meant to be. It didn't <clears> fit in the engine bay. It turned into a nightmare of trying to trick the Jeep computer into thinking the engine was running. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the kind of thing... If you had a daily driver and you had a car to go out on the weekends and you had a project car, this is the one you want to be your project car. <laughs> okay. it's, it's going to take, it's going to take six months to work out all the bugs. You're perpetually going to be tinkering with it. You're always mm-hmm. sort of fighting some problem or other. It is not a reliable, dependable, you know, every day, just turn Swap, the key and it yeah, works. No. Yeah, it just, it just wasn't meant to be. And actually, the engine sucked diesel and ran away and blew up and it all went up in a big puff of smoke. Yeah, and, and that almost derailed the whole Africa trip. It was, it was a very big, hurtful learning experience for me. Oh, um, shit. I had no and idea. And it's funny, like, for years and years, I've been saying, like, I would never do a, an engine swap again, you know, even if you held a gun to my head. But in recent years, I'm toying with the idea again. <laughs> but but I, I do put that caveat on it of like, I would never do an engine swap on a vehicle that I'm actually going to take on a trip or rely on. Or even if I just wanted to go up to Alaska and back, I would never do it in an engine swapped vehicle. I think that's mm. just a, a world of pain. But yeah, if, if I'm ever in a situation in life where I have three cars and one of them can just be a project and probably off the road for two years, maybe I would do it as a fun project but not as a, as a reliable, actual, I use this thing every day. Before. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that not just myself, but a lot of people I know have come to realize is that the more stock components you have on a long journey, the more likely you are to be able to fix it 
Um, and I, I'm telling you this as, you know, you're like probably the master of knowing this, but <laughs> engine well, I mean, swaps, I'm, you know. I only learned that through a, a massive fail. So <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's not like I'm a guru. I just figured it out by getting it wrong. That's, and that's how you find out. <laughs> it's 100% something we talk about all the time on the show. It's like, you have to go and do. You have, we have to make mistakes. We ha- hope, hopefully not to the tune of the amount of money <laughs> that that engine uh, ran into, but like go experience life. Don't just sit around and, cause it's a great story, Dan. Oh, and, <laughs> and not just the engine swap, but in, you know, a million different things. Like if, if you're hell bent on running 37 inch tires, like do it and see what it's like and live with it for a few years. See what the gas mileage is like, see how mm-hmm. your ball joints hold up. Yeah. And maybe you'll love it and you'll do it again in the future. Or, or maybe you'll say, oh, actually, I didn't really need those. Maybe right. 34s is enough for me. Like it's pros and cons, depending on the time in your life, depending on what kind of trips you're doing. There's, there's no right answer. There's just like learning and different answers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Enjoy so those much. stock gears on 37s <laughs> for, you know, six months until you hate yourself. <laughs> Yeah, exactly right. And learn all of the kind of the cascading effects of upgrading something like that and pros and cons. Like if, if you take it to Moab and reel it, wheel it really hard, yeah, maybe 37s is a great choice and, and it's going to put a million smiles on your face. But if you live in Australia and they, uh, they you know, charge you $5,000 to run 37s, maybe don't. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah. And if, and if you want to do a massive expedition like down to Argentina think of the gas bill if you're going to drive on 37s <laughs> yeah and then immediately, 32s <laughs> yeah yeah and then yeah. immediately say to yourself all right I, I could go to work for two more years to pay for all the gas i'm going to burn or i could just not have 37s and go right now right that's, we the, that's something that richard and ashley talked about with little red with the the dust of glory guys of like what an average day on the road costs and like the tire size going up increases the cost yeah. of the day like absolutely yeah and there were those days where like you fill up the tank in the morning and it's you know like 60 bucks or 80 bucks and then you fill up the tank in the evening again and it's 60 bucks or 80 bucks and you're like oh my Uh-oh. god i've just spent like half my month's budget in like <laughs> yeah. one day i'm like what am i doing yeah yeah like so we had sean holman of four-wheeler on was that last weekend that was last weekend and sure yeah. And, and I said to him, I was like, okay, what, what's the first thing I need to know about modifying the jail? And he's like, well, if you're going to, when you go to, you know, 30, I was like, no, 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 no. I, I, I just want to <laughs> the maximum amount possible on 33s. Not everybody needs 37s. You know, you can have a perfectly good time and see all of the shit you probably want to see on 33s. Hundred percent. I couldn't agree with you more. And yeah, it's more important to get out there and go have those adventures and don't worry about what size tires you've got. I love looking at Iceland uh, car culture Instagram <laughs> with their forty fours and talking about that's a different let's, world. Let's just go big. Let, let's forget yeah, the thirty sevens. Exactly. I'm, I'm going straight to forty four. Yeah, not even forties. Like forty four. Like. Oh. I love them so Maybe much. Maybe Australia doesn't even have laws for that, and I'll just skip right over. They'll be so far above, they'll be like, "Oh no, that's fine. You, you, you can so get away good. with that." We'll just, we'll just, we'll ship a van from Iceland to Australia. Like it'll make sense. Yep. <laughs> Temporary tags. Just run it. See what happens. I wonder. Would would tires that big actually be good in the sand? I guess they would. Yeah. If you air it, them down enough, you just have a massive what? flotation. It's what the do you air forty fours down? Eight. <laughs> Eight. Eight? That's what they they run across the glaciers in like forty fours, and they run them at like eight psi. At eight psi? Yeah, they're bead locked. Like <laughs> I run my contact quad patch like is five. So contact patch of one tire is bigger than my four tires. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, it's like as wide as your truck. I yeah. think that's what they run them at. I oh man, eight I'll never PSI? Google this fast enough. Aren't they all like they're like super swamper TSLs? <laughs> it's yeah, they, like, they are it's a like, massive it's like the tires you saw in jeeps in 1997 yeah yeah and i guess if they're bead locked you can go as low as you want it doesn't matter uh what's um <laughs> this says 3.3 or 2.4 psi <laughs> or it, it like... says psi after the number 
And this is actually on the Arctic Truck mm. Experience website. The 3.3 is a nice curved, perfectly nice tire. I could share my screen. What am I what? describing yeah. with words? Dan, do you have beadlock laws in Australia? Uh, I think so, yeah. And and beadlocks, I just am not even interested in. They're not something I've ever thought about. They add weight. They're annoying. Just would never even consider them. So, so look at the wrinkle on the 2.4. Yeah. It doesn't <laughs> even get wrinkle into the 2.4. <laughs> That's insane. Usually when I see 2.4 PSI, I, there's a substantial leak from something or somewhere. Like if you didn't think about the weight, there's a good chance that tire can suffocate things. <laughs> <laughs> Just in, in case of suffocation emergency. Exactly. <laughs> Hold it down with the wheel. <laughs> uh, oh, no. Sorry. <laughs> Off the rails. <laughs> Didn't someone describe us as serial killers the other day? Wasn't that? Yes. Thing? <laughs> yeah. That, no, that was, um, that was last night. That was Alana telling us that we could, we could collectively be Alana share of car and driver, ladies and gentlemen, he told us that we could both be serial killers and we wouldn't know Just until we, we tried to serial physically been in the same room. Yeah. <laughs> now it all makes sense. Uh, yep. All adds up. It all adds up. Oh, geez. but yeah, I think a glacier truck would be amazing. Oh man, <laughs> I guess someone has to find out. Wow, oh. I don't think I can build that. <laughs> no. I need a beater for those because they are amazing. Too bad beaters right now are like ten thousand dollars. Yeah, there's no such thing as a cheap four wheel <laughs> drive at the moment. I, I've I've done in my waiting for my Wrangler to arrive. I've done quite a lot of Craigslist and Facebook marketplace searching. Everything expensive. It doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. TJ's. Sorry. There's a six door. Oh, come on image. There's a (laughs) six door excursion. And now it's totally befuddling to me that I cannot open the image. (laughs) And now it's all gone because I asked for the large sizes. It's like now I must have this in my life. Yeah, mm-hmm. I want it specifically. <laughs> yeah. Here's a four door one, and it's just I love everything about like they're yeah because you can get a diesel excursion too. Yeah, be careful. Shut up, Russ. <laughs> be careful. We know what happens with those diesel excursions. The V10 is the way to go. Yeah, I know. Also. The uh, fender flares on the excursion picture there add fifty percent width to said excursion. Yeah, why not go bigger? <laughs> yeah, it's not big enough already. No, I'm kind of close to Texas. It makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing else to say. Cur- curbs, curbs are not an issue in this truck, Ross. I can go wherever I want. Oh my! Especially God. at three psi, I'll never even feel it. The freedom to roam. Yeah. <laughs> you'll feel a shudder what was that mazda it's fine yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ooh, fences. lots of things don't add uh. an issue anymore <laughs> oh fences ditches kangaroos uh, yeah yeah they're almost big enough they act as flotation devices it'd be like sherpish sure ah, sure now we need it now we need a floating vehicle so we can cross some lakes and stuff You've Just invented go right back to the excursion with, with yeah. sherp ish. That is a, a new phrase. Dan, do you have any like animal related concerns? Because I, I personally like on our stupid Connecticut back roads, I'm terrified of hitting a deer. You know, they are dumb and they move quickly. Yep. Yep. Over here, hitting a kangaroo is a very real possibility. They're pretty much like deer. They're, there's probably more of them than there are deer. So, yeah, driving at dawn and dusk on certain roads is essentially a guarantee you'll be dealing with kangaroos. Um, so I will install either a hoop in my current bumper or I'll be getting an aftermarket bumper. Still working on that. But definitely it is a concern, yep. And so have to be very, very careful. Yeah, they don't call them ball bars. They call them rue bars. Exactly right. Rue bars, got to get one. That's not even a joke, Russ. It's... No, I, I know. Yeah, I know. Know. <laughs> yeah, it's true. You got the dad joke reaction to that. And I was like, no, it's not a... We call them stingers in the Northeast, but, you know. 
Is that like the cop car reference? No. Oh, I thought they were called stingers on cop cars. <laughs> uh, we're getting regional, regional language tonight. Yeah, no, we're not talking <laughs> regional sandwich language here. We're talking regional bull bar language. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's okay. how you know we're deep into the off-road thing. It's not a hoagie. <laughs> not a grinder. Nope. Yeah. Oh, sweet. <laughs> Thanks for coming on, Dan. <laughs> Two nights, back-to-back show nights for us are kind of rough, I guess. <laughs> You're welcome. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs> yep. That's it was a uh, pleasure as always. And uh, yeah, we very, very much look forward to keeping up with your adventures and, you know, hopefully getting you back on sometime middle, middle trip and then after trip and, you know, I'm recapping everything. 100% want to hear your uncle's accent. I need, I need a video <laughs> yes. clip at least. Oh, yes. I okay, yeah, I'll, I'll make sure to get videos on YouTube and Instagram of like catching a shark or doing something that's yes. like, Please. it's going to blow my mind. So I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to blow your mind. My, my brother-in-law loves to shark fish. So definitely. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, and I've watched uh, enough Australian TV that like I'm pretty good at the accents. Like I, I can't do them myself, but I can understand them. That's uh when when you're you know like hunkered down for a few days, let's line up an impromptu show and and try to see if people can actually understand him. <laughs> Sounds like a lot of fun, guys. <laughs> Sweet. Uh you can rate and review this show on iTunes. Please be kind after this. <laughs> if you got to the end, you get a cookie. Yeah. <laughs> uh let me know. Seriously, I'll make a cookie. Uh you can like subscribe to us Don't on eat Chris's cookies. You can also subscribe to Dan on YouTube. The Road Chose Me on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and Expedition Portal. Yes. Correct. Did I forget anything? I think that's it. All the places. Uh, All if the places. you're in Australia, you can say hi to Dan once lockdown ends. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just wave for now. Wave, yeah. <laughs> no contact. Uh, you can follow Hooniverse, The Hooniverse on Twitter, The Real Hooniverse on Instagram. You can read our writing on Hooniverse. UTV driver, ATV rider. Ross is at no, not like the one from Friends. And I'm at Overlanding Dad. And that's it. We did it. We did the show. We're done. We've done it. And if anybody is actually listening, please read my New Hampshire piece on ATV rider, please. I'll go read it. I'm still curious please about side by sides. So you should get some seat time in a side by side. Are side by sides a thing in Australia? Good question. No, no, they're illegal on the road. And so I well, don't really think anyone has them yet. Any, they're so very, like, very illegal on the road is here too. <laughs> unless you're in Arizona, like there's, they don't care in Arizona. Or New Hampshire. Yeah. Uh, but no side-by-sides, like trails or stuff like that down there at all? Not that I know of. I feel like things like that do eventually come like sort of from US to Australia, but probably going to be another five or 10 years, I guess. Okay. What about ATVs? Uh, farmers use ATVs but I don't think they're popular for because the distances are so big. Yeah. I don't think sort of little dinky vehicles like that are, are very useful. People rather have like a big 79 series Land Cruiser, you know, that comes from the factory with two 20 gallon diesel tanks and you, mm-hmm. know, you can, you can drive a thousand miles without refueling. Yeah, no, hun- I mean, 75 miles, hundred miles on, on an ATV is all the tanks going to get you. Yeah. Okay. I've got a non, related question now did the toyota talked about recently putting emergency response systems in land cruisers because it was the easiest way to help people in remote australia be able to get a signal out kind of thing i wonder if that ever became a thing i don't know i didn't hear about that it was like all of the land cruisers combined would be able to then help get like piggyback messages for like distress calls and stuff like that oh yeah interesting uh, I'll have to get back to our audience on that. That might actually be a, a carryover <laughs> tidbit. Uh, <laughs> Meanwhile, people are finding out that they have uh, Toyota tracking them in their land cruisers. No, no, like <laughs> I, I definitely think it, you, it was like an optional opt-in kind of thing. Uh, I don't think it was that bad, or maybe it was just I a don't know. concept. Sounds like they're uh, checking everybody's throttle position and uh, land speeds, and you know, it was called the Land Cruiser Emergency Network. That just sounds like that that makes sense. Sounds like a support system for people with Land Cruisers and can't figure out why they're broken. (laughs) (laughs) 
So it's no, like it's uh, I hate, no, sorry, that's I hate mud. <laughs> <laughs> so it definitely uh, was a like a yellow device that you could put in the back of your truck if you wanted to. Like it uses Wi-Fi, UHF, and delay tolerant networking. Oh, interesting. What's that watch that sends an SOS if you like? It has like a one-time pull pin. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Is it a, it's not bright thing. It's. Uh, I don't know which fancy watch it is, but I definitely know it's a thing. Yes. That's because <laughs> we all saw of. Hammond use it in Canada, and then they took uh, forever yeah. to retrieve him. Yes. <laughs> yep. It's just like pull that out of your Land Cruiser. <laughs> Oh man! So and this, this is from 2016. Else. I don't know if it ever became a thing because I think it needed government help, and I don't know if it got it. <laughs> so anyway, I like I like ideas when people are trying. <laughs> yes, very much. <laughs>